Support for LAist comes from Pasadena Water and Power. Every individual's actions matter in preserving resources. Join the ripple effect to build a more resilient water future. Learn more about water programs, workshops, and ways to save at pwpweb.com slash the ripple effect. I'm Julia Paskin. Join me as I talk with NPR's Sarah McCammon about her new book, The Exvangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. That's April 25th at the Crawford. Tickets at LAist.com slash events. LAist Studios. Today on the LA Report, we check in on a stretch of Highway 1 in Big Sur that keeps crumbling into the sea. It's a beautiful place to go, but it's also a horrific place to build a road. Also, we have last-minute tips to enjoy tomorrow's solar eclipse. And later, tsunamis pose a real threat to Southern California. We'll explain how even a small tsunami can be life-threatening and have a big economic impact. It's Sunday, April 6th. I'm Julia Paskin, and that's coming up on the weekend edition of the L.A. Report from LAist 89.3. But first, here's the latest news. Repairs are being done on a stretch of Highway 1 in Big Sur that was partially eroded during last weekend's rainstorm. It's one of several repairs to the scenic highway in recent years because the area's picturesque steep cliffs are also what makes it so prone to landslides. Marine geologist Dick Norris says that means the state will have to keep investing in Highway 1 repairs. Big Sur Coast, we we pay for it, basically, in the sense that it's a beautiful place to go, but it's also a horrific place to build a road. Caltrans engineers are installing a traffic signal to direct traffic while they work on a permanent fix to the erosion. Monday will be the last time we see a solar eclipse in the U.S. for the next 20 years. LAist science reporter Jacob Margolis has this list of viewing events. First, check your local public library because those seem to be the spots for small gatherings, like in Silmar and Studio City, where they're passing out glasses and making pinhole cameras to project the changing shadows. Then there's the party at Caltech, where you'll be able to look through solar telescopes and bug astrophysicists with all your awesome questions. Sadly, the Mount Wilson get-together was canceled because of weather and road issues. For more viewing places, go to laist.com. And with every big event comes the commemorative merchandise. So if you're looking for Eclipse swag, LAist reporter McKenna Sievertson has these options. T-shirts, mugs, posters, a playlist. The solar souvenirs are endless. To watch the eclipse, you'll need a pair of protective glasses. And Bill Nye and his science guy bow tie are featured on a pair from the Planetary Society. Drawing inspiration from its namesake, Sunchips is celebrating with a special offering. But the pineapple habanero and black bean spicy gouda flavor will only be available during the 4 minute and 27 second eclipse window. And after a long day of traveling for the totality, a spritz of the Sole Noir perfume can remind you of the essence of these celestial events. I'm McKenna Sievertson. Well, fun souvenirs aside, if you want to look directly at the eclipse, viewing glasses are a necessity. Mark Margolis is the president and owner of Rainbow Symphony, which has been making eclipse glasses for decades. He's also the father of LAist science reporter Jacob Margolis. Mark Margolis says they've sold more than 10 million pairs ahead of this celestial event. Everybody is going to need a pair of glasses. We cannot make 350 million pair of glasses, but we've actually done quite well. Margolis says safety is important, so keep an eye out for counterfeit glasses. Look for an ISO mark and the company's name on each pair. That way you know where to turn if there's any problems with the product. All the recent rainfall can cause more seasonal allergies. Jonathan Tam is an allergy specialist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We are seeing a lot of allergy symptoms, runny, sneezy, and particularly itchy, watery eyes during the seasons where that pollen is sort of thick in the air. Tam says rain can also break down pollen, making the allergens more potent. Plus, storm-induced humidity can lead to mold and dust mite growth, which can also trigger symptoms. Here's his advice for limiting your exposure this spring and summer. As long as temperature permits, you know, keeping windows closed during those periods so that the pollens aren't coming into your bedroom and just depositing on your bed where you're, you're breathing it in. If you've tried different medications but still can't find relief, Tam says you may want to consider allergy testing, and that could pinpoint the issue. 
The 1970s Chicano movement in L.A. has been well documented. The Chicano movement in Long Beach? Not as much. A new photo exhibit seeks to change that. LAist correspondent Adolfo Guzman Lopez has more. In the early 70s, Chicanos from Cal State Long Beach founded Centro de la Raza in East Long Beach. They provided summer school for youth, legal and housing assistance, and arts classes to further the goals of the civil rights movement. Ron Arias helped run the center. At the pinnacle of the organization was close to nine or ten million dollars, and it started as a as a fifty thousand dollar storefront. The center's story has been nearly forgotten, but a first time exhibit of photos taken by John Tabuada, one of the center's activists, captures his friends and colleagues at protests, teaching kids, and creating art. I'm Adolfo Guzman Lopez. The exhibit is currently at the Historical Society of Long Beach. We have details at LAist.com. More after this break. Support for LAist comes from the Southern California Horticultural Society, hosting the Ruth Boren Lecture Series in honor of Ruth Boren and her love of Mediterranean climate gardens. Curator Brian Kemble of the Ruth Bancroft Garden in Walnut Creek will lead a lecture titled All Plants Come From Somewhere, How Plant Origin Clues Make Us Better Gardeners, April 12th at the Blinn House in Pasadena and live streamed on Zoom. You can learn more and become a member of the Southern California Horticultural Society at SoCalHORT.org. Support for LAist comes from Pasadena Water and Power, inviting everyone to join the Ripple Effect, Water plays a pivotal role in our lives, and every individual's actions matter in preserving this resource. Each action we take starts the ripple of change, making a greater impact throughout the community. Be part of the ripple effect and learn more about water programs, workshops, and ways to save at pwpweb.com slash the ripple effect. Back now to the L.A. Report, I'm Julia Paskin. Tsunamis pose a real threat to Southern California. They can be triggered by earthquakes, landslides, and other events near and far. And officials want us to be ready because even a small tsunami can be life-threatening and have a big economic impact. I spoke with Costas Sinolakis, professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Southern California and director of the USC Tsunami Research Center. He began explaining how tsunamis can really vary when they touch land here. It really depends uh, where the event uh, comes from, whether it's what we call a tele-tsunami, which means a tsunami that comes from really far away, like a tsunami that impacts us from Chile or Alaska or Japan, or whether it is a local tsunami. Uh, Local tsunamis are more threatening per se because uh, they may penetrate further inland. And the maps that we have are... um, uh, good maps in the sense that they give an approximate line where people should evacuate to and uh, of of potentially flooded areas. So it can really range depending on the event. And this is where we hope the uh, warning centers will come in. For tsunamis that come in from far away, we have anywhere from 10 to 20 hours of warning because it takes that long for a tsunami to come in from Chile or from uh, Alaska, but for a tsunami that takes uh, that happens locally just offshore, we're only going to have minutes worth of warning, if at all. Is it because of the the proximity, or are those underwater uh, land movements uh, off the coast are they also stronger? Uh, both. Oh. Uh, uh, you really uh, uh, one is the proximity. The closer the closer the source of the tsunami is, the smaller the propagation time. The less time it takes to strike the coast. The other part of that, that we have is that, uh, I mean, in your previous segment, you mentioned the Palos Verdes uh, landslides. Uh, not only landslides happen uh, onshore in Palos Verdes, but they happen offshore. I mean, if you continue off Palos Verdes and uh, I mean, you go close to what we call the continental shelf, uh, there there is evidence of, uh, his, uh, of landslides that have taken place two, three, four thousand years ago. And uh, those generated large tsunamis. Can you give us some more examples of of tsunamis that have uh, hit our coast here in California and maybe more recent history? Uh, 
if we talk, I mean, in the, in the, in the recent history, I mean, if we start uh, going back from uh, uh, the 19, um, uh, you know, from the 19, um, 46, which is the Aleutian tsunami. I mean, this is also, you know, the Aleutian starts from the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. This is a, an event that ushers, if you will, the modern era of uh, tsunami, uh, of tsunami warnings in the United States and around the world. The United States has been a leader in uh, issuing tsunami warnings, but for the first uh, 50 years or so, they were primarily focused uh, to Hawaii. And then people started realizing that the western coast also had a very high uh, risk of, uh, of tsunamis. So just going back um, from the, um, um, in the last, uh, in the last uh, 50, 70 years, uh, Southern California was hit by a tsunami from uh, Chile in 1960, from Alaska in 1964. In fact, 1964, the tsunami hit also Northern California and uh, in Crescent City. If memory serves me, about 20 people died. There was extensive damage in Crescent City. And then uh, moving forward, again, when we started having these mega thrust earthquakes around the Pacific, in 2010, Southern California was uh, was hit, uh, 2011 from the Japan tsunami, and then again in 2015 from the Chilean tsunami. In 2015, the most of the impact was in Ventura Harbor. In 2010, most of the impact was in the port of LA. And how substantial was that impact for folks that, you know, they may, they may say, what's a tsunami hit? I didn't know that that happened. How, how substantial was that impact? Uh, this is a, this is a very good question. And we really need to educate people about this. It so happened that the impact from these tsunamis was only concentrated inside the ports and inside the ports, there were very, very strong currents. And, uh, you know, some ships were out of control. It looked like uh, as if um, we saw what happened with the accident in uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, where you had a ship just go a little bit out of here, out of control, and you see what the consequences were. Imagine inside the port, these uh, giant ships going out of control because of the very strong tsunami currents. Because one of the things that we found out both in 2010 and then in 2015, even small tsunamis of the order of less than a foot, uh, hardly noticeable you know, along the coastline, they can generate really strong currents inside the ports. And these currents can have uh, catastrophic consequences, just like um, what happened in, uh, in in Baltimore. It's just that we were lucky in, 20, in 2010, and there was a warning, so ship, I mean, the operations in the port of LA uh, shut down. Uh, in, 20, in 2015, the impact in, there was impact in Ventura Harbor, but of course, Ventura Harbor is much smaller. You don't really get this uh, behemoth thousand foot long ships uh, moving around. But what really concerned me was in um, uh, in 2010, there is this uh, uh, movie taken from the Santa Monica Pier uh, in uh, in Southern California, where you see the, uh, uh, the harbinger uh, warning of a tsunami, you see the shoreline withdrawing, and it looks like a fast receding tide. So people are on the beach, Unfortunately, Santa Monica at the time had not evacuated the beaches. So people are sitting on the beach and they're watching this shoreline recession. They're watching this uh, tide moving out, fast moving tide. Within five minutes, the tide moves out the order of about, um, uh, maybe about um, a quarter of a mile, which is very unusual. What do people do? They see this fast receding tide and instead of heading for high ground, they just linger around, they go in, they try to see all the little critters that the fast moving tide, the fast receding tide has exposed on the seafloor. And they're just sitting there. And then luckily, when the main wave of the tsunami came, it was very small, so people didn't get hurt. But uh, this was, we never know exactly uh, for these tsunamis that are, you know, very far away, exactly what is the size of the wave that's going to strike the coastline, particularly when this wave is going to be uh, less than, uh, you know, two feet. We're going to know if the wave that strikes is going to be 10, 20, 30 feet high. But when it comes out, out to these smaller waves, which are more common and which can affect people, um, you know, there we really do not have 
uh, our models cannot really differentiate and tell uh, anyone with any degree of safety uh, or you know that the tsunami is not going to flood the entire Santa Monica Beach or the entire Venice Beach uh, or um, you know any of the Southern California beaches. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how to prepare. You mentioned uh, the shoreline receding, that if you see that, do not go and investigate, move to high ground. Uh, what else should folks know, uh, either as an indication or once they've realized that this is happening, uh, what they should do? Right. Uh, the other uh, the other telltale indicator that, that there is a tsunami uh, uh, imminent is the... Um, uh, an earthquake that lasts, earthquake shaking that lasts more than 15, uh, uh, 15 seconds. The reason is that uh, the bigger the earthquake, the uh, the longer the shaking. I mean, we should think of earthquakes and earthquake faults as being giant zippers. Uh, I, if you have a really long fault, like for example the San Andreas fault, um, and you know it, uh, you get a magnitude eight or eight point five earthquake. The shaking will last likely from three to you know, four, three to three and a half minutes. Uh, it's going to be a lot of shaking. I mean, if you have a small earthquake at a magnitude less than six, the shaking will last you know, one or two seconds. So, as a community, we set up the. Uh, I mean, say that if the shaking lasts more than fifteen seconds, this means that this is uh, you're experiencing a fairly strong local tremor. Uh, which, if you're on the beach, you don't know where the tremor is. Is it inland? Is it offshore? So, uh, if you're on the beach and you experience earthquake shaking that lasts more than 15 seconds, this is the time to move to high ground. In practically every Southern California, every California beach, um, there are tsunami evacuation signs, um, and you just follow them and you just, uh, you know, move away from the beach. I mean, there's no need to move miles inland or to move to... Um, you know, up the mountains, but um, in most places, tsunami hazard zones are clearly marked. So all you need to do is just move out of the hazard zone and wait there for at least half an hour uh, until you get an official notification that there is no hazard from a tsunami. Um, I was hoping you could tell us where we are in terms of our notification system, when a tsunami comes and how listeners can get tapped into that. Right. We're doing very well when it comes in to tsunamis that come in from uh, uh, what I said earlier, the tele-tsunamis that come in from different parts uh, across the across the Pacific. Uh, we're not doing equally well when it comes to local tsunamis because of the time. I mean, it takes time for the warning centers to actually uh, analyze the earthquake, uh, make a determination whether it is the kind of earthquake that can generate a tsunami, and then issue a warning, and then this warning to trickle down and come to the to the people. What we need is, uh, you know, reverse 911. There was a nationwide test in the aftermath of the Maui fires. Uh, there was a na- nationwide test back in, uh, in October. The wireless emergency alert system was tested on cell phones, and we hope this has never been tested in, uh, in, in terms of a real tsunami, when I mean, in, uh, with a real tsunami, and we hope that the system is going to be ready, operational, and people uh, will um, head the warnings in the unlikely event we get a tsunami in California. That's Costas Sinalakis, professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Southern California and director of the USC Tsunami Research Center. Thanks for listening to the Weekend Edition of the L.A. Report. The Weekend L.A. Report is hosted by me, Julia Paskin, and produced by Monica Bushman and Kevin Tidmarsh. Our engineer is Sean Corey Campbell. The podcast is edited by Fiona Ng. Catherine Melhouse is the Director of Content Development, and our Vice President of Podcasts is Shana Naomi Crockmall. Join us back here tomorrow. You can read more at LAist.com and listen live on the LAist app or on the radio at 89.3 FM. Listeners like you help make the L.A. Report possible. Please donate at laist.com slash join. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Southern California a better place to live. L.A.ist Studios operates within the homelands of the Gabrielino Tongva people. 
we recognize the painful history of displacement, settler colonialism, and erasure of the people, their language, and their sovereignty. Visit laist.com slash land for more information. We encourage you to get curious about the land on which you live and work. Oscar Gomez was a rising star, a radio DJ and a Chicano student activist, until his sudden and mysterious death. His friends and family didn't have closure. And all that's public record, right? That I can request. Well, see, here's the problem. What are you guys looking into this for? A quest to get answers. Imperfect Paradise, The Forgotten Revolutionary. At las.com slash imperfectparadise or wherever you get your podcasts.